tonight. The travel ban is back. There's no immigration legal definition for what a bona fide relationship is. The caliphate begins to crumble. And the chemical killing bees. More than two years after it ended combat operations in Afghanistan, NATO announced plans to deploy a few thousand more troops in the country and declined to give a timeline for what it says is a training and support mission. We're in it for the long haul. It's a democracy that's asked for our help. There are already more than 15,000 NATO soldiers in the country to train and advise the Afghan military. Most of those NATO troops are American. Australian Cardinal George Pell, the Vatican's treasurer, is denying the sexual assault charges against him. There's been relentless character assassination. I'm innocent of these charges. They are false. The 76-year-old is taking leave from the Vatican to fight the allegations, which resulted from a two-year investigation in his native Australia. The State Department approved its first arms sale to Taiwan under the Trump administration and it exceeds a billion dollars. President Obama also made a few big arms sales to the island, but this one comes at a time when the Trump administration is trying to work more closely with Beijing, which rejects the idea of Taiwanese sovereignty. Attorney General Jeff Sessions moved to ease concerns that the Trump administration won't protect minority groups as vigorously as the Obama administration did. We will continue to protect the civil rights of all Americans, and we will not tolerate the targeting of any community in our country. In a report released today, the Justice Department said that while roughly 250,000 hate crimes occurred between 2004 and 2015, more than half of them were never reported. The House passed two immigration bills today, sending them to the Senate and advancing President Trump's immigration agenda. One of the measures seeks harsher penalties for people who repeatedly enter the U.S. illegally. The other would allow Washington to withhold certain funding from so-called sanctuary cities. There are lies trying to convince American citizens that immigrants are not part of this country. There are lies trying to convince American citizens that these bills will make us better. It will only make us worse. It's been three years since ISIS declared a caliphate, and Iraqi forces have fought a grueling battle to take back its territory ever since. In the last few months, that fight is centered on the city of Mosul, where ISIS maintains its last stronghold in the country. But today, Iraq's prime minister announced a huge victory and said that the caliphate is dead after the Iraqi military recaptured the Al-Nuri Mosque, a symbolically important site in the heart of the city. Ben Anderson is in West Mosul, where he's been following the Iraqi army's painstaking attempts to cut a line between two of ISIS's last remaining positions. One of them is a hospital, which gives ISIS snipers a huge military advantage. The other is the Old City, where most of the remaining ISIS fighters are hiding among civilians and making a brutal last stand. This is the Iraqi army's 9th Armored Division. They're trying to push through Al-Shifa district, all the way to the Tigris River, slicing the remaining ISIS-controlled territory in two. Guys. They're saying this is a uh, suicide bomb belt. The soldiers are clearing one building at a time, but the streets in between remain exposed to well-trained and determined ISIS snipers. And by clearing a line through the middle of ISIS territory, they're exposed from both sides and spend as much time as possible behind walls. A 
small unit of soldiers tries to push forward. But within minutes, an ISIS sniper claims yet another victim. They call in strikes from the air and ground, targeting high buildings very nearby and the Al Imam Mussin Mosque, just next to the river, which marks their final objective. <laughs> The snipers somehow avoid the non-stop barrage of strikes, constantly reappearing and attacking again from other well-concealed firing positions. The soldiers haven't moved forward at all in about two hours. The snipers are still able to work, still getting very accurate shots into the soldiers here and here. There's a porter cabin and an oil tanker have caught fire right in front of us. Civilians flee whenever they can, also crossing streets that are open to the ISIS snipers. The fighting never stops. But the 9th Division needs to push forward and edge their way closer to the river that divides the city. They send out coordinates for more strikes on the buildings they are running towards. They run into recently struck houses, not knowing if ISIS fighters could still be inside or watching close by. As soon as they make their way forward, they're told there's a suicide bomber walking towards them from just a few houses away. The suicide bomber escaped. After eight days of near constant airstrikes and ground fighting, the Iraqi army was able to enter the last few buildings just yards away from the river. The 9th Division has finally liberated Al Imam Mossin Mosque and now control a slither of land between ISIS's most important remaining strongholds. But there was a church and a mosque side by side here. This is the last building before the river? So, tactically, what does that mean? Now you've managed to separate the hospital from the old city? So this is the Tigris River just here. There's an Iraqi flag in front of us, another Iraqi flag here. So they've, they've made it, they've, they've pushed all the way to the river and separated the hospital from the old city, which means however many fighters left in the hospital are now cut off and completely surrounded. The next step is for other branches of the Iraqi security forces to try and divide the old city into four smaller pieces and just you know, push however many ISIS fighters are left into smaller and smaller parcels until, until they're all gone. 
This took seven or eight days. And that time they probably cleared 10, 15 buildings. So it's taking much longer than everyone thought. It's much harder than everyone thought. But very slowly, bit by bit, building by building, they're, uh, they're taking Mosul. Travel Ban 2.0 officially goes into effect. And this time around, there probably won't be scenes of chaos and families separated, because unlike the first travel ban announcement, this one didn't come out of thin air. 72 hours ago, the Supreme Court allowed a revised version of the ban to go into effect, as they wait until the fall to hear the constitutional arguments around the president's order. But in the meantime, there are exceptions. Any person from the six targeted countries with a credible claim of a bona fide relationship with a person or entity in the U.S. can come in. The problem is there's no standard legal definition of a bona fide relationship. Vague language from the Supreme Court means that the Trump administration's State Department gets to fill in the blanks, and overnight they did. According to the State Department, a bona fide relationship is essentially a parent, child, spouse, sibling, and daughter or son-in-law. Lawyers say they'll be stationed here at JFK because they're expecting confusion around what the term really means. There's no definition. There's no immigration legal definition for what a bona fide relationship is. There are other terms that qualify relationships in immigration law that are defined. Bona fide relationship is not one of them. It was left to the discretion of the, of, you know, the administration to implement. The administration said on a briefing call today that they basically cribbed the definition of family from the Immigration and Nationality Act and added mothers and fathers-in-law because the court told them to. But for the communities actually affected by the ban, the prospect of having to defend certain family relationships is downright offensive. I am Syrian American, so to us, you know, family is more than just your nuclear family. It creates a lot of confusion to try to explain what does that mean. So there's a little bit of a cultural discrepancy there between how the State Department has defined families and what they actually mean in various cultures that this is going to impact. Yes, definitely. I think it's dangerous when uh, a government is trying to redefine what family means. President Moon Jae-in of South Korea arrived in Washington today. And this evening, he began two days of meetings at the White House. At the top of the agenda is figuring out how to stop North Korea's nuclear program. Neither country currently has a proven strategy, but even if they can agree on a way forward, an even more daunting step may lie ahead. Direct negotiations with the North Koreans themselves. Ambassador Mitchell Reese learned just how hard that can be when he served as lead negotiator with Pyongyang during the Clinton administration. The key difference is the vast cultural gulf. The isolation is significant. What that means in terms of day-to-day -day negotiating is that you have to proceed through three different sets of traps. The first is you have to make sure that you share the same concept. Do they have the same concept of nuclear weapons as you do? What's the words that you use? Are the words similar? And that's where you then get down to the, the final level. They often ascribe different meanings to the same word. And so you go from concept to word to meaning. That takes an awfully long time. So you've got to prepare yourself to go forward in a very methodical way. You can't make assumptions that there's similar cultural touchstones or reference points. They're extremely sensitive about any references to their leadership. Often in these negotiations, there was a member of the security force watching what they said, watching how they behaved, and reporting back to the Capitol. They don't always have the flexibility or the freedom to say or act the way one would assume. So how would I sum up diplomatic history between the United States and the North Koreans? There were hopes, sometimes punctuated by limited success, that we could actually find a diplomatic pathway forward. 
Nothing in the past 50 years has really justified the continuation of that hope. We have to look towards other options, such as denying them the technology and the money that they need to build these programs and making sure the deterrence remains strong because the North Koreans are committed to developing nuclear weapons to protect their regime. The current leader's grandfather started the program, his father accelerated it. It's inconceivable to me that there's any prize, any rewards that we could offer that would persuade him to abandon the course that the country has been on for more than half a century. For years, scientists have been sounding the alarm over the use of neonicotinoids, commonly called neonics, a major class of insecticides that they say have been contributing to the decline of the bee population. They're the most widely used type of insecticide in the world. Scientists' concern about these chemicals have been growing, but researchers hadn't been able to demonstrate that harm on a large-scale basis outside of the lab. Until now. Today, scientists publish results from the largest and most realistic experiments ever conducted on how neonics affect bees. You know, those animals that are directly and indirectly responsible for pollinating one-third of the food humans eat. One of the studies was conducted in Europe, and the other in Canada. I talked to Dave Golson, a bee specialist who didn't work on either of the studies, about why they matter. The new European study is by far the biggest field trial done so far. It, it tells us what happens in the real world, basically. And the answer is that these chemicals are certainly bad for bumblebees, solitary bees, and the evidence is pretty strong that they're bad for honeybees. The new Canadian study looks at how much of these pesticides free-flying honeybees are exposed to and found the bees died earlier in life and that queens were more likely to die. In the past, pesticide companies brushed off scientific results showing the negative effects of neonics. They would say the studies were either too small or unrealistic. But this time, two of the biggest manufacturers of neonics, Syngenta and Bayer, actually funded the European study. According to one of the researchers behind that study, Bayer and Syngenta did this because they wanted to see how a rigorous, large field study would stack up against previous findings. But that move backfired. These studies found the same as previous ones, that neonics do harm bees. Though Golson says the results may not ultimately matter to them in the long run. I imagine they have a well-planned tactical retreat and that they have another chemical up their sleeve ready to roll out immediately when neonics are finally banned. Syngenta didn't respond to our request for comment. When we asked Bayer about the studies, they said that it's worth noting that both US and Canadian regulators recently found that the risks of these pesticides are low. Given the Trump administration's skeptical approach to environmental regulations, it's likely that neonics will stick around in the US for a while longer. This is 327. I'm going in. Good luck, Agent. Agent 327 is based on a Dutch comic about a secret agent. Just a trim, please. Boris Agent 327. It was created through an open source software called Blender and directed by Colin Levy. He quit Pixar to work on it, and nobody quits Pixar. Levy learned 3D animation by playing with Blender as a kid. Blender was a free and open source tool that I could just download for free and, and, and just play around with. It was incredibly difficult to pick up. <laughs> and uh, I, I deleted it within two days of, of you know, trying to make a cube. Big studios keep their software secret. But Tom Rusendahl, Blender's founder, made his 3D animation software available to the masses almost 20 years ago. In those days, a 3D program would easily cost uh, 60,000 euros. It's ridiculous. And the computer would also cost 60,000. And I thought, I'm going to try to do something with Blender. I put it online and see what happens. And suddenly I had a community and a website and forums. And if you had that in 99, you were hip and cool. Rusendahl's online forum developed into the Blender Cloud, the software's learning hub. It gives users a step-by-step -step look at how animated films are made and how to make their own. The whole process and all the files were open. And that's 
perfect for open source developers. Yeah, there are all those cats sitting in the bathrooms uh, uh, coding things. Levy turned his hobby into a career with Blender. His big break came on Blender's third open movie project, Sintel. And that landed him a job at Pixar. I used Sintel as my reel, essentially, to apply to the layout department at Pixar. And I got a job there. Levy left Pixar after nearly five years, with credits on Inside Out and Finding Dory under his belt. And he got into the director's chair, back at Blender. It feels really weird to quit your dream job. I wanted to spread my wings a little bit and, uh, and, and figure out how to direct. But Pixar is a huge studio, you know? It's they got 1,200 employees. Blender has 10. The teaser for Agent 327 was funded by the Blender community. But the studio needs bigger investors to make the feature film, which comes with a $15 million price tag. Pretty routinely at Pixar, huge sections of the movie are just thrown, thrown out. I was so impressed with how crappy those movies start and how amazing they typically end up. On Agent 327, the short, um, even though it's very simple, there's not a huge amount of story there, um, there were some aspects of it that were kind of broken and we were able to kind of make the pieces come together a little bit uh, better. And, and I think that some of those lessons or my confidence in applying that sort of force, that, that pressure in the process uh, came from my Pixar experience for sure. That's Vice News Tonight for Thursday, June 29th. Tune in tomorrow night for the award-winning documentary series, Vice. Judge, hold on, I may have the wrong person here. It's immediately obvious how overworked the public defenders are. In a perfect world, it would be best if, you know, I had enough time to meet with each of them. Unfortunately, you almost have to pick and choose. There's been a handful of times that I went to court and the public defender not even show up at all. We've talked to you more than we've talked to our lawyers in a year. 